So, hi there, everyone, and welcome to your April edition of our monthly magazine, Starry Skies, the program where we tell you about what you can see in the night sky this month. I'm Mark Hardacre. And I'm Steve Tonkin. And this month, we're going to be talking about uh, total eclipse of the sun that's happening in the USA on the 8th of April, about our comet now in the sky. Ah, yes. And about the importance, Steve, of dark skies. You're going to tell us all about that. Yeah, because uh, people don't realise what it is. They think it's all just so astronomers can get pretty pictures. But we're going to disabuse you of that idea. We certainly are. And our constellation of the month this month, if you want to have a quick look on the website before we get there, uh, is the constellation of Virgo, the maiden. So we'll get to that uh, shortly. Now, normally about this time, wouldn't we, we'd be telling you about the planets visible in the April sky, but... Well, there's not that much to be seen. <laughs> uh, well, the planet Mercury, if we start yeah. nearest the sun, yeah. At yeah. right at the beginning of April, if you're lucky, you might get a glimpse of it. It's, it's past its best. Evening yeah. sky. Look at where the sun set, a line between that and the planet Jupiter, which looks like a bright star low yeah. down. And... Use binoculars once the sun's gone. You might just pick it up. It was lovely during March. We had a during the middle of March. It was a, a, a really quite a nice sight uh, from our observatory at Knowlton. Mm -hmm. But it's now diving between us and the sun. It's going to arrive between the Earth and the sun. I think on the 11th of April. Yeah, and that's called inferior conjunction. Anyway, so Venus is similar. Uh, mm -hmm. Only it's moving behind the sun, so we won't see that for most of the month. Mars is slowly emerging from the sun, so we can't see that in the morning sky. It's coming. It's going to be yep. beautiful in the autumn time, yep. but forget it for right now. Um, what else we got? We've got Saturn is not far from Mars and also rubbish. Yep. Uh, so the only thing we've really got left is Jupiter, which is hanging on for grim death in the, <laughs> in the evening sky in, uh, in the west. Yeah. But the sun's catching it up, isn't it? Yeah, it's ca so, you know, we, we're going to lose that this month, end yeah, of this month. It's, it's not really very good no. because you're only going to see it in twilight, and that makes it difficult to pick yeah. up any detail. And by the end of the month of April, we've mm -hmm. lost it yep. really until when? Late August time, I think we'll start to see it again, probably yeah. July, August. Yeah. yeah. No, but what we do have, because we have it every month, is the moon. That's it. And there's a nice little effect on the moon. They're called Claire Obscure effects, which basically they are a play of light and dark. And if you look along the Terminator, which is well, nothing to do with Mr. Schwarzenegger, it's the, <laughs> it's the boundary between light and dark on the moon. That is where you see the most detail. And on the night of the 15th, early morning of the 16th, when you've got a half moon in the sky, if you look at it, even with binoculars, you'll see... It's just a, a weird effect you get with some of the way the craters are. There's two letters from our alphabet there. There's the lunar X and the lunar V. Have a look. And it's, they just sort of stand out like two little... Uh, someone's written on the moon in light. All oh, right, yeah. So worth having a look at. Claire yeah. Obscure. Claire Obscure. There we go. Uh, anyway, so we're... Um as, as the moon rotates around or moves around the Earth every month, of course... It trips through all the zodiac constellations and um, once a month it gets pretty close to the sun and this month it's going to actually run across the face of the sun and there'll be a total eclipse where the shadow of the moon falls upon the earth now sadly it's not going to be in the uk mm -hmm. uh, we might if you're in the far west uh, outside of forest fm land you might see a little tiny clip out of the sun but yeah. but here in uh, uh, rain dorset hampshire i don't think you're going to see anything no nothing nothing but if you if you do travel west if you happen to be on holiday in cornwall or west of wales or even better ireland then as the sun sets you'll see like a little bite out of the sun yeah and this is on april the 8th yeah now i'm a little luckier because i'm going to actually fly across to texas Ooh. to see uh, a total eclipse <laughs> this will be my third but i wonder how how many of our listeners remember the 11th of August 1999 when we last had our eclipse mm. in uh, total eclipse here in England? Next one's not for another couple of hundred years. Yeah. So we're not going to see it, are we? Oh, ah, well, um, let's move right along. What else we got to talk about today? We've got... Um... <laughs> We've got our constellation of the month, which is Virgo. So to find our constellation of the month 
The easiest way to do it is something we've started talking about already. You take the handle of the Big Dipper, the, pl the plow, you know, that's a major, and it's a curve, it's an arc, and you follow that arc down and you get to a bright yellow star, which is Arc Turus. Uh -huh. And then you just go straight down from that. So you spike down to the brightest star in Virgo, which is Spica. So it's Arc to Arc Turus and Spike to Spica. And it's a brilliant white star. Um, and that is the primary star of the constellation of Virgo. Yeah. And uh, Virgo really is one of the one of the twelve zodiac constellations, of course, but also one of the oldest. Uh, this was recognised as a constellation back in the Babylonian times, and uh, the Greeks and the Romans, especially, associated somehow with agriculture. Mm. And you often see the maiden depicted holding a corn or a cornucopia. A cornucopia, a horn of plenty. A horn of plenty. So I don't, I don't. Again, there are many different myths associated with this constellation, but they all seem to have maidens and corn and yeah. and agriculture somehow in them. But just back to uh, Spica. Spica is uh, it, that, that's an interesting star. Uh, as Steve said, it's uh, a blue white star. It's about two hundred and fifty light years away from us. Whoa! Yeah, which means the light from it set off during the reign of George the Third, and during the time that our friend Mr. Messier was looking at his objects and um, and Mr. William Herschel compiling his list of, uh, of fuzzy objects in the sky too. But it's a super super star. It's extremely hot. That's why it's blue, and it's also a double star. And it's a double star that's really too close to be seen with a telescope. You can't see the two individuals. But they're so close to each other, they rotate around each other every four days. Wow. Imagine that, two stars rotating around each other every four days. That's got to be close. It's very close. And it, that it's they go around so quickly that they're not spheres. They're actually ellipsoidal, which means they're what's that, like, like discs, more or less, like discuses. So yeah, that's uh, that's something special about Spica, and uh, there are many other bright stars in uh, Virgo. It's not the most, it's not the easiest of constellations to recognise, is it, Steve? No, oh, but if you go from um, Spica, you've got it's part of a Y, yeah, and that's your, and that Y sort of leads you to the bowl of Virgo. Sometimes it's called, but if you've got a dark sky and a either big binoculars, so. 10 by 50 is just about, but you have, if you've got 70 mil binoculars, 70 millimeter, or a small telescope, have a look around there and you'll see loads and loads and loads of little fuzzy patches. Um, there, you need to get let your eyes get dark adapted. You want to do it when the moon's out the sky and you want to be somewhere dark. And these are galaxies. And I bet you can't count them. <laughs> yeah, there, this is a so, this is called the realm of the galaxies. It's mm. an area in the sky where we're actually we're looking out of the galactic plane, aren't we? Mm, we're yeah, looking we'll... away from the Milky Way, mm. up into the depths of the universe. And because there's no dust there, of course, we can see all these galaxies. And yeah. there is literally hundreds of them there. Yeah. Not I mean, a lot of them very faint, but but as Steve was saying, quite a few with binoculars, with, with yeah. decent sized binoculars, you can see a good, yeah, 20 or 30, I'd say. Yeah. Even there are 11 Messier objects, um, objects that Mr. Charles Messier saw from France in the 1700s, um, all up to 50 to 100 million light years away, these mm. things are. Ah, it's, a, it's astonishing. Once you start looking at at the distance of galaxies you start thinking well what do these numbers actually even mean yeah, which yeah. it's out of human experience what does 50 million light years mean in miles and how long would it take us to get that Im impossible to imagine yeah um but one of the most beautiful galaxies uh, and it's on our map by the way we've posted a, a map of virgo mm. Uh, mm. on our Forest FM website, also on our Fording Bridge Astronomers website and the Wessex Astro Astronomical Society website too. But if you have a look on there on the map, you'll see M104, meaning that's the 104th object that was seen by Charles Messier, and it's called the Sombrero Galaxy. So why is it called that, Mark? Well, it's a galaxy that's sort of tipped a little bit edgeways on towards us, and it has a dust ring 
around it, and that dust ring looks like the rim of a sombrero hat. Ah, OK. So, have a look. We're going to post a picture of that, too, and it's it's really quite easy to see that in mm. binoculars. Yeah, That's, that is. Uh, you can't see... You probably won't be able to see the dust ring. In a medium telescope, maybe not in binoculars, but it is it is lovely to see. And yeah. if you've got a camera and a, or a photographic system for a shoot in the skies, then have a go on 104. It's, uh, it's, it's lovely. It is indeed. I remember the first time I saw it, I just discovered it by accident. It was a <laughs> scanning the sky. What is that? And it's, it is, well, I knew it was a galaxy, but it is lovely and unusual. And of course, I didn't discover it. Mr. Messier did. He did. He was such a nice fellow, that Mr. Messier. Anyway, for all these things, for all these objects in the sky, of course, we need a dark sky. Yeah. And uh, it really has been a shame over the last 50 maybe 100 years, but last 50 years, that we've started to lose the dark sky, haven't we, Steve? Oh, it's even longer than that. It's at least 120 years yeah. that we've... And gradually... So we're, we're now living in a situation where 90% of the world's population has never seen what was the birthright of everybody, every sighted human being yeah. who had ever lived up until about 120 years ago. Yeah. And it's just gone. It's a shame. And Steve, you've been at the forefront of the campaign to keep the stars dark for a long while, haven't you? Yeah, I started getting interested in it in the late 1980s. Um, and it's, I mean, one of the things we noticed very early on was that there was a correlation between light pollution and the incidence of breast cancer. Uh -huh. And we thought, oh, oh come on, this, this, this can't possibly be, this has got to be a statistical coincidence. And then... Um, a researcher by the name of Hahn in 1989, he published his paper, which showed that women who are profoundly blind in both eyes also have a lower incidence of breast cancer. Uh -huh. And then, so there's got to be a link somewhere, wow. and, we, and we now know what it is. And it's not just human health. Um, farming Today, the good old Farming Today on BBC, um, reckons um, last month, or the month before, that we have lost 63% of our insect populations in the last 30 years. Yeah. And that has a direct economic impact um, in that we're getting less pollination. So the figure that was given out was gala apples. So one variety of apple in one county, Kent, the loss of crop due to poor pollination because of the lack of insects is now costing farmers about five million quid a year yeah and, and that's, that's that's really that's it so it's not we we really want to emphasize here yeah. the dark skies it's not about us astronomers being selfish steve is no it? no this is something it's it's not sustainable right um to to lose our invertebrates at the rate we, at which we are losing them yeah um so yeah and we would all benefit. The, th the thing is, the solutions to this are so incredibly easy. Yeah. Um, and the only people who, who don't benefit if we implement decent solutions are people who sell energy and people who sell rubbish lights. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So yeah, it comes down to why install a bad light when you can just install a good light. Right. So there's five principles to this. The first one is, is the light actually necessary? Because actually, if it isn't, it's by definition useless. Secondly, is, is the light directed to only where the light is needed? So it's putting the light in the right place. Because if it's not, then it's, you, again, you've got light going where it's not needed. It's going to cause a problem. Then is the light on, on is it controlled? Is it only on when you need it? So it's light at the right time. So you use passive infrared detectors. You use timers. So the light's only there where you need it. And then it's gone. And it, when it's gone, then it's not causing any harm. We need to use, get away from this idea that um, some light good, more light better. It clearly isn't. Yeah. Um, if you're driving and you've seen the glare of car headlights coming towards you, you know that more light isn't better because it dazzles and it's yeah. da it becomes dangerous. So we use the least amount of light necessary for the task. If it's, as long as you're using as much as necessary, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. And lastly, and this is really important, you know how there's a quality difference of light. You get what looks like warm light and you look what looks like really cold light. The cold light is bad. This is the stuff that um, it affects your sleep hormone, melatonin. It um, is 
very dangerous to some insects and is the one that is implicated in health issues. It also scatters more in the sky. And that's the one that is from the headlights as well? It's from it? headlights. Yeah. It's from these ultra-intensely bright headlights. It's from the cheapest LED lights that you can buy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they, they've got this bluish tint to them. And that's what we need to get rid of. Yeah. If we can, and if we can do that, so you get the right sort of light in the right place at the right time with the right controls, we're there. And it's so easy to do. And then everybody and everything benefits. Any other pollutant, if we got rid of it, so if we started you know, reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or methane or anything like that, you're looking at decades before it has an effect. If you do it with light, it's literally instantaneous. <laughs> you are solving a problem with a flick of a switch. And this is why we're so keen on getting it done. And this is why... Um, we've got our International Dark Sky Reserve on Cranbourne Chase, which we're ho hoping to show people what it is like under that. So we get people out stargazing. What you do is, as your eyes are dark adapting, you listen, you start hearing the sounds of night, because it's not just the sky. It's this whole dark habitat that's so important. And then as the skies darken, if we get people looking at that, the way I see it is... Stargazing is an entry-level drug to caring about the skies. It, it is. It, this is it. Once you realise how beautiful yeah. it can be, then you start caring about it. And, and also, you know, when Steve and I have been doing this uh, with others, doing the outreach with, with, with especially with children, with mm -hmm. young people outside as it gets dark on a dark sky. They are not used to seeing the stars. They're, they're, they're at mm. home, they're watching their TV yeah. or whatever. You get them out under the stars and the wow factor of them seeing the yeah. skies as our ancestors used to see them. That's yeah. your point, Steve. Yeah. Is that our grandmas and great-grandmas and so on back through time used to sit around a campfire or, or at home and it was dark outside. You open the door, it was black mm. everywhere. And it's only like uh, 120 yeah. years, as Steve was saying. Yeah. So, what? But what? What can I do? What? What can our listeners do, Steve, to improve it now today? To, now today, check that your lights are shining downwards. That's probably the most important thing you can do. Like my security light, you mean? Yeah. If you've got if you've got a security light, make sure that it's pointing downwards. It doesn't need to be pointing up into the sky. You are not going to get burglars arriving by air, <laughs> and. You don't need it on all the time. So if it's on a, contr if it's on a controller, because um, if it's on all the time, people just get used to it and, and see it there. Crooks need light. Um, you know, if, if l artificial light at night was the solution to crime, Las Vegas would be crime free. <laughs> it's, just, it's, you know, let's think of it like that. Crooks need light. Why provide them with a courtesy light? Why provide them with a, a glow in the sky that says the owner of these premises thinks there's something here worth nicking. You know, it's have it on a controller. Then if somebody arrives, then you notice a change. And humans are really good at noticing good change. At change. So as you can tell, Mr. Stephen Tonkin <laughs> is a passionate believer in uh, dark skies. And I think it's something that is becoming more... Uh, people are becoming more aware yeah. of it. It's clear that, uh, as we've talked about CO2 and our, our global environment, that this is another area where we can take action. It's not yeah. something that is going to be decades. We can do something today. Yeah. We can turn our lights off. And if only the council, and we should be talking to them as well, would realise that if they turn the street lights off from 1am until 5am, um, it would save a lot of energy. And it would also save our birds from waking up at four in the morning and yeah. chirping and chirping when they need another extra hour. Yeah, in. indeed. And I, that, and it's one thing I we must emphasise though. This isn't about getting rid of the lights. Yeah. I mean, we we need light at yeah. night for safety. We yes. need it to commune with each other. Oh, if, if lockdown taught us anything, with with social beings, of course we need light at night, and. In particular, the perceived safety of women and girls at night is important. It's not about getting rid of the light. I'll put, say it again. It's having the right light in the right place at the right time. Anyway, so that's our... That's <laughs> My our polemic. This month, isn't it? <laughs> My polemic for the month. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> 
And uh, if you want to come and join our campaign, uh, join our passion here, uh, we've got a couple of astronomy clubs here in the in the area, as you probably have heard mm. already. Fording Bridge Astronomers, we meet at the uh, Elm Tree Inn in Hightown on the third Wednesday every month. Mm. And we're a fun bunch of people. We are of uh, all races, genders, sexes, everything. We have a good time. Uh, we try and get out with our telescopes as often as we can. Of course, with this horrible weather we've been having, Steve, it's not, <laughs> yeah, we, but... we've hardly been out, but we can't change that. Uh, the other club is the Wessex Astronomical Society. Mm -hmm. uh, down, they meet at the Allendale in Wimborne on the second Tuesday yeah. of the month. I think it's second or first? It's the second Tuesday. Second Tuesday. I keep uh, no, no, it no. It's the first. It's the first Tuesday of the month. What are we sorry, talking yeah, about? Sorry about that. Right. Yeah, so, sorry about that, Wessex. We, 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 but it's definitely the first. It is definitely the first. And uh, we have another astronomical society as well that's close by, up in Cranbourne Chase. They meet in Shaftesbury, a little bit out of the Forest FM uh, listening area. Mm. But uh, if you live up that way, um, they meet as well uh, once a month. I think it's the second Wednesday, Wednesday of, yeah. uh, of every month. So you'd be surprised how many little clubs and groups there are of uh, astronomers from all ages, all abilities. Don't think that your, you know, you, your knowledge of astronomy is just basic. There are many people like you out there. Come and meet us. We'll help you with your telescopes and mm. get you set up. It, it's yeah. a fun hobby. Yeah. And on this business of helping with your telescopes, if you don't have one, don't get one until you've been to see what sort of stuff we've got. There's some really good stuff out there which you can pick up at a very reasonable price. There's also a load of rubbish yeah. which can actually cost a lot more. And we can guide you in the right direction yeah. so you're getting something that is easy for you to use the key for when you're beginning astronomy is you have equipment that's easy to use absolutely and don't be conned into buying something that says 600 magnification see oh. the moons of uranus it's not practical no. y you'll end up frustrated or your child more likely and that's mm. the worrying thing yeah uh, with it with a, with a sparkling interest in astronomy is suddenly the whole thing is snuffed out yeah because this rubbish kit makes astronomy difficult and it doesn't have to be yeah. observational astronomy can be a joy it can be easy it's the sort of thing once you know how to what, what sort of kit to use you can be doing it easily you can be set up easily and that ignites a passion it, 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 it doesn't snuff it out with what we call hobby killers yeah Great. So we're, let's get off our soapboxes, shall yeah. we? we? That was a bit of a soapbox <laughs> episode this uh, this this month, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But never mind. We'll be back in normal form in May. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you. Don't forget the website, the Forest FM website, the uh, Fording Bridge Astronomers website, and the Wessex website. We'll all have the constellation of the month of Virgo, the charts on there. We'll post pictures of the um, M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, yeah. for you, and anything else that takes our fancy. So Indeed. have a look there and come and join us whenever you can indeed so this is mark hardacre and steve tonkin wishing you all the best and we'll see you clear skies goodbye